My Schlingit name is Dana Chitzeik, and I got that from my great uncle. My English name is Chuck Miller. I'm of the Raven Moiti Silver Salmon Clan. We refer to our clan as the Coho Clan. We don't waste anything. We take what we need and we leave the rest. And if we take too much, which is not on purpose, we share with everybody. We share no matter what, but we make sure everybody's fed. It's a tough environment to live here in Southeast Alaska. So adapting to it and being a part of it and learning to adjust to it, it's been very important for our people. Very tough people, very tough. And we're still here. The elders said, we need to do something. We got to preserve our culture. We got to preserve our history and teach it to the younger people. Classes began here at the A&B Hall. A lot of time was spent here in this building. I practically lived here. It was the very first hall that was built here in Southeast Alaska to help with our native rights. On the National Registry of Historic Places, the Alaska Native Brotherhood Hall is struggling to keep their doors open. The building is just too expensive to heat. In the wintertime, the furnace always went out. It's always cold in here. I mean, you have to use a lot of oil for that. A lot of oil, and it's not very reliable. The A and B Hall is hoping to replace their diesel boiler with air source heat pumps, popular in Sitka and throughout Alaska for their efficiency and reliability. But they're expensive to install, so they're raising money and applying for support through the Sitka Carbon Offset Fund, subsidized by local and tourist donations. They call our town Sitka. It comes from our traditional name, Sitka means the village behind the little islands. To this day, the islanded community of Sitka, running along 14 miles of road, reachable only by boat or plane, has upheld those Alaska Native values of sustainability as one of a growing number of towns in America powered nearly 100% by renewable energy. We're leaving Jarvis on our way up to the dam then okay. we'll stop at fish valve unit and then hit the powerhouse. Okay, sounds good. There's been hydro generation on and off since 1915, 1917, I think was when the first power plant was put in. And this is where I tie up in the morning as I'm rowing or taking the skiff across. If you look out across the bay, that island is our family homestead. My first realization of what electric power might be was when I was about five years old and out of the island homestead we had no electricity so lighting was candles or or, uh, kerosene lamps and my father came home with a small thousand watt generator and suddenly we had bright lights just like downtown. Since then uh, I've always been fascinated by electricity. Sitka has two hydroelectric power plants that power all of the city. Uh, We have a backup diesel generating system, but that is used very periodically for maintenance. We're in the Tungus National Forest, but when we get up to the top, that then is land that is part of the Blue Lake project that is owned by the city. Oh my god. So, God. careful, careful, <laughs> put your hand on the handrail and you stand here. So, from the top of the water reservoir of the dam to the bottom yeah. is about 220 feet. And if you look all the way over and down, there's a plunge pool that dissipates the energy from the spilling water before it flows down the creek. As an islanded utility, we produce all the power that's used on the island. And that's why they're keenly focused on making sure they don't produce more or less energy than they can use. Our rainfall average is 85, 90 inches a year. A very dry year is 50. A very wet year is 125. I think we were maybe 120 last year. So we don't have constant power we have interruptible power or excess power generation. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars on our hydro infrastructure, but realistically, we're at about two thirds utilization of our hydro generation potential with water spilling over the dam. While Sitka may have energy to spare today, that could change in the near future, with plans for a new hospital and Coast Guard expansion underway, not to mention the cruise ships carrying nearly half a million tourists to the small town every summer. With all this uh, 
fluctuation of revenue coming into town with the tourism industry. Is the city of Sitka going to use this money to help reduce the cost of electricity? Are they going to use it to reduce the cost of waste? The goal of the department is to keep rates low, which can be difficult when you live on an island in southeast Alaska. What's the best economic model for development that doesn't crush a community that's struggling to keep livability in, in check? Um, what are the technologies that we invest in that will be viable 10 or 20 years from now? Finding a way to store energy over the long term or be able to use it at will is really what the future has in store for us. As we look to utilize our system at 100% of its capacity in order to generate revenue, uh, it makes sense for us to go into hydrogen production or ammonia production. If we can take excess electrons, generate a decarbonized fuel that we can store for months or even years, what does that do to a really isolated community? In Alaska in the wintertime, there's not much sunshine and things don't grow, but what if you took that decarbonized fuel, put it in a fuel cell that would produce both heat and electricity, and you put it next to a greenhouse? So now that rural community could have food, it could have electricity, and it could have heat. Food is the energy for people. And what does that do to the supply chain where you have airplanes and barges, and by the time the food gets there, it's two to five weeks old. But if you're growing your own local food, keeping the dollars within the community and building independence for those communities where they aren't tied to a pipeline or an oil tank, now you're going somewhere and you're rethinking the paradigm of how we look at energy. We are indeed community owned and we're directed by our city administrator and the city assembly. Therefore, everyone in town has input really on what we do. Which means the Sitka assembly will ultimately decide if they explore decarbonized fuel. But here's how it could work. Using excess power generated at the dam, Sitka could electrolyze water, producing hydrogen and medical grade oxygen. The air around us is 80% nitrogen. If you put nitrogen and hydrogen together with the right catalyst, you get ammonia. And when you overlay a wind map of the U.S. with where nitrogen is used for fertilizer, the two are almost right on top of each other. A farmer could be producing his own fuel and his own fertilizer right where he uses it. Ammonia, if nothing else, even if it wasn't a fuel, it's a commodity that we could export. Big ideas like these got the attention of the Department of Energy. And now Sitka is participating in the Energy Transition Initiative Partnership Project, ETIP for short, giving the city direct access to the National Energy Labs and the Renewable Energy Alaska Project, also known as REAP, to help them build resilience with beneficial electrification. Beneficial electrification is using electricity to displace oil so that the money stays in your local economy, isn't exported with each empty oil barge, and that nobody loses from the proposition. Utilities win when we sell more electrons. Uh, people win when they have access to clean electricity. Sitka's grid will soon need to account for beneficial electrification in a key area, that same challenge the A&B Hall is struggling with, indoor heating. The cost of heating homes in, in Alaska is considerable. It's the biggest part of everybody's personal budget is space heating. And so when you install a heat pump, even though it may cost you money up front, it takes very little time to pay it off. An air source heat pump costs about $6,000, no small chunk of change. But with new federal funding, Alaskans can qualify for tax credits and incentives to help cover the cost of installation. The return on investment doesn't take long, though. It can be five years or less, uh, depending on the price of oil. We put a heat pump in the house, the main part of the house, a few years ago, and took out the diesel heater. A single mom. Eve was having trouble heating her basement, which doubles as headquarters for her small business and her son's playroom. Because this is where the boat, where they come onto the boat. Only on fishing tips with my mom. Did you see I turned it down? I did. She applied for the Sitka Carbon Offset Fund, and she qualified for an air source heat pump. And it was wonderful. The heating bill went down, didn't have to smell the diesel's exhaust. Don't have to go, well, am I going to turn the heater on today or not? After we got ours, several neighbors started getting them too because they saw ours was working. And they've kind of caught on around town. But what is an air source heat pump? And how does it work? 
I like to say that our planet is a heat pump. So much of the energy arriving from the sun is concentrated at the equator. The majority of evaporation that happens on the planet happens at the equator. And those clouds that form then migrate to higher latitudes. And they carry with them that moisture that condenses and then falls as rain. That movement of moisture is also carrying with it a phenomenal amount of thermal energy. So all that heat energy that we get at the equator is then moved from where it's hot to where it's not. So a heat pump can be absorbing heat outside and moving it to the inside of a house, or it can be on a hot day absorbing the heat from the inside of the house and moving it out and act as, a, as an air conditioner. That's some serious science. <laughs> it is, but it's built on simple principles. Right. Yeah. The big question I have is, uh, do we have the commitment and leadership to develop our renewable resources. We have them all around us, but it takes a lot of work and it takes a political will to, to bring those to bear. We could install heat pumps all over the place, but we have to have the hydro resources to make the electricity clean and cheap enough to run those. If our community entirely switched from carbon fuels to electric overnight, it would overtax our system. Causing the utility to lean on their backup diesel supply, which would undermine the plan to decarbonize. What's the point of installing an air source heat pump if you're using expensive fossil fuels to power it? Southeast Alaska is, is very diverse. All the communities are, are geographically very separated from each other by water, there's no roads to speak of much. So every community has its own power grid, its own energy systems. If you have enough of a concentration of people, you can afford to develop hydro systems, which are expensive. Ironically and sadly, it's dirt cheap to put in a diesel system. And it really uh, stymies economic development for those communities. They're paying uh, 60 cents upwards to a dollar sometimes per kilowatt hour for electricity. And places farther north that are that become ice locked in the winter, they have to get their, their oil in before freeze up. Uh, it's always a race. And, uh, and some communities have to have their diesel flown in. So you can only imagine the cost of diesel and therefore the cost of electricity and heating in those communities. We get a barge from Seattle, that takes a minimum of a week, and it's expensive. But I would say, take any major city, what would happen when truckers don't drive trucks? You have food insecurity. That's not resiliency. Manufacture a decarbonized fuel if you're up in the Arctic, but in the summertime, you have 24-hour daylight. In the wintertime, you have 24-hour darkness. But while you're out hunting, fishing, collecting berries, a solar cell is producing fuel all summer long, and when you come back, the tanks are full, and that carries you through the winter months. And again, it provides heat, it provides fuel. That's resiliency. When we talk about sustainable, we're really talking about the big business picture, the business of living on Earth, the business of having our utilities. Uh, to me, that's sustainability. Sustainability in Southeast, to me, means that the indigenous cultures that have lived here since time immemorial, they are able to have access to resources and economy that allow them to maintain their way of life. Sustainability has always been their way of life. Colonization has brought many gifts and lots of technology and wonderful things that we all appreciate, but there's some other things that have come along with that. And so picking the best, from technology and making room for the resurgence and the, and, and the return of, of native cultures here is a big part of sustainability. I was born on a cabin where the water came up under at high tide. We didn't have cars where I grew up, it was all skiffs. So I've been in a boat since I was born. I was a couple months old when we were fishing for coho, king salmon, trolling. And I learned how to walk on the boat. We're part of nature, we live in nature. Going to a big city and seeing everything be concrete and stuff, you still see the weeds and the cracks on the street. It's like nature's still there, nature's still trying to come out and exist. But everybody's moving so fast and consuming so many resources, we forget that we're part of nature too. If human beings were made out of the coniferous trees like the, the 
the yan, the hemlock, or the shei, the sickest spruce, or even the cedars. We might live 300 to 800 years old, but because we're made out of shei, the alder, alder doesn't last very long. That's what we're made out of. Just like the tree, when we pass away, we go back into the earth where we came from. That's what we're made from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the end of our story. Goodness, Chish, for listening. Thank you.